everybody. This is the introduction to the materials of structural masonry. My name is Sam Rubenzer. I'm an engineer at Force Consulting, licensed engineer in the state of Illinois, and a professional engineer in many of the Midwestern states. Uh, here at Force Consulting, we have a lot of experience with masonry design, as well as steel, concrete, and wood. We are also consultants to the masonry industry since February 2010. For this presentation, really we relied on several different resources uh, for defining this uh, masonry materials, uh, really leaning a lot on TMS 402602, uh, the current 2016 code. But we also use the NCMA tech guides quite a bit, as well as other resources on IMI web. So the learning objectives for this morning is really to acquire some insights about the basic components of structural masonry. Uh, build up a little bit of a knowledge about the different materials so that we can understand how that we can vary the materials for different types of designs to make a highly efficient design uh, with masonry. We're also going to look at the local strength of masonry, how it affects many different areas of masonry design, and then comprehend some best practices and how to design uh, structural masonry more efficiently. Uh, really, when we want to compare masonry design, um, we're first going to start with actually comparing it to steel and concrete design. Uh, usually when structural engineers look at either steel or concrete, uh, we have a lot of variability for when we want to increase the overall design strength. If we do a design and we don't have enough strength, uh, we simply can use larger sizes, use higher strength materials. Really with masonry design, though, we see a lot of engineers just starting with minimum strength, not actually understanding the accurate strength, um, but starting with a minimum strength. Uh, and then if we need more strength, just using larger blocks and, and that's it. And really, that's not the way that we want to see masonry design being done. We we'll really want it to be done on a similar perspective as what you look at for steel and concrete. You need more strength, you use larger blocks. Uh, first, maybe understand what the actual strength is before you even go to a larger block, uh, but then recognizing that you can also specify higher strength uh, of masonry. You see, masonry is available as a product, which is kind of similar to steel, right? It's available as a product. There's producers that make the product. Um, but what is certainly different from steel is masonry block uh, strengths definitely vary uh, within different areas of the country, different aggregates, different uh, mixes from different manufacturers. Uh, so there's a variance with the, the actual structural masonry materials, uh, somewhat more similar to concrete. Uh, it's pretty easy to modify sizes. You can certainly do a special order to increase strength. And so that maybe that's where masonry is kind of similar to concrete design. Uh, if you need more strength, uh, increasing the actual uh, design strength is something that we have available for masonry. So um, really what we want to do is elevate uh, an engineer's understanding of masonry design uh, so that we can bring it more in line with uh, both steel and concrete design. So the focus for today, what's, uh, what's in masonry? What are the different masonry materials? Uh, we have blocks, which is obviously the key component, uh, either concrete or clay units. Uh, that are going to use to comprise most of the wall. Uh, we have mortars uh, that can come in type N, uh, the lower strength S uh, or M with it be a higher strength mortar. Uh, we have grout, comes in a different couple different varieties as well. We have fine coarse uh, or self-consolidating grout. And then to reinforcement, we have vertical reinforcement. Uh, typically, most masonry elements span vertically. Uh, so that's vertical reinforcements mainly in their four strength. Uh, horizontal reinforcement can sometimes be for strength, say for a horizontal spanning wall, uh, maybe a masonry shear wall, we need some uh, horizontal reinforcement, but most often their horizontal reinforcement uh, in masonry wall is primarily there for crack control, uh, certainly in the Midwest and in lower seismic areas, uh, crack control becomes very important uh, for horizontal reinforcement. And then going with the horizontal reinforcement, another material that we have to understand is the materials that are used for uh, creating control joints uh, in our masonry walls. So first we'll start with block. Again, the concrete masonry unit uh, governed by ASTM C90, uh, which would be the primary uh, masonry element. Uh, we have clay hollow structural brick, uh, ASTM C652. This is a lesser known uh, material, but certainly something that's highly efficient and actually has uh, incredible strength properties. Um, so both uh, concrete and clay can be used as uh, reinforced um, structural masonry uh, units. Uh, certainly you also have clay veneers, which would be non-structural. So I just want to make sure people don't get confused. Uh, you have clay veneers, non-structural, which would be governed by ASDM uh, C216. 
block shapes, something that we have to be familiar with as engineers. Uh, we have many different block shapes that are available. Uh, certainly different types of block shapes help us uh, create different design elements within a wall. Uh, you have the standard kind of two cell unit uh, that we'd use predominantly within most masonry elements. Uh, we have something similar for clay. We have two primary uh, cells for reinforcing. Uh, but then we also have uh, bond beam units where we have some openings uh, for the reinforcement where we have uh, webs that we can knock out so that we can more easily create horizontal reinforced elements within the wall. But then other specialty shapes, uh, eight shapes or A-shaped uh, blocks are also available, um, which was certainly important when we get into heavily reinforced uh, masonry walls. How do we determine the masonry wall strength from block test results? Uh, there's really two different options, prism testing uh, or the much more common compressive strength method. Compressive strength method is really just becoming familiar with the table from TMS, uh, understanding uh, what your actual block strengths are. Again, those are uh, that's information that we can get from the actual block manufacturers. Um, and then the mortar that we specify. So once we have those two different components, uh, we really can determine what the overall uh, net area compressive strength of the concrete masonry assembly would be. Uh, so we'll come back to this in a little bit and talk a little bit more about uh, what you can expect within different areas. Another common question are, are normal, medium, and lightweight blocks uh, of different strength? Um, and really, they're not necessarily of different strengths. If you look at ASTM C90, uh, both or uh, all lightweight, medium weight, and normal weight blocks uh, really do kind of rely on the same minimum strengths. So from there, um, it really depends on, again, different block manufacturers and, and mixes and aggregates that are available. And so you certainly see some variants. Um, I've seen lightweight blocks that are on the high end of strength uh, formation or design and uh, normal weight blocks that can be uh, all, all over the place. So you really have to have an understanding for uh, what the actual block manufacturer is making. It's not necessary, necessarily the case that lightweight would be, uh, say, less strong. Next within masonry, we have mortar. Uh, we have type N, S or M. Uh, again, mortar is really going to be the uh, other primary element that you're going to see. So certainly architects care about what the color of the mortar is, perhaps, to make sure that we have the right uh, overall aesthetic for the wall. But from a structural perspective, it's it's also very important to make sure that we have a workable paste that, that binds the blocks together. It's going to be uh, obviously a cementitious material that becomes hard when it sets. Uh, it's made of a mixture of sand uh, and a binder element, such as cement or lime and water. Um, mortar, the one thing that I think is the most misunderstood part about mortar is the overall strength of the mortar and how it's tested. We really have to be careful that we understand uh, mortar strength versus uh, the assembly strength from the different types of mortar um, because the strength of the mortar is really not a key component in the overall strength of the wall. It does have a uh, it does change the strength of the wall if you use, say, a really uh, weak mortar, but it's, it's the wall is not as weak as the mortar, and we'll show that in a little bit here. Uh, what different proportions go into different mortar types? Uh, what is the average strength of the mortar? Uh, both of those um, uh, questions could be answered. Uh, again, within TMS 602, uh, you can see all the different types of ways that you can get uh, different types of mortar, uh, the M, S's, and N's. Uh, and even O, if you wanted to have something that was really um, kind of on the, the weaker end, maybe something that you would use for retrofitting. But, you know, all those different type of mortars have a pretty much of a prescriptive way in which you can create them. Uh, and then the, the chart on the right, you can see several different properties of the mortar. Um, uh, in the third column, you can see the average compressive strength. So you can see that the mortar strengths uh, do vary quite a bit. Um, and I see engineers, again, get, getting hung up on the average compressive strength. Uh, which again does uh, have some effect on the overall strength of the wall, um, but not nearly as much as what that what that column suggests. Um, and so for the next slide here, what I really want to look at is again, the three different predominant mortars that we see used uh, within structural masonry. We have type M, uh, S, and N. Uh, really the mortar compressive strength really does get a lot larger as you go from the right type N uh, to type S to type M, which would be the much the certainly the most com uh, the highest compressive strength for the actual individual mortar. But I would say that's a, a pretty small um, uh, element or small component of the overall uh, design because really it comes down to uh, what the actual mortar 
what it yields in the overall assembly. Uh, and you really can kind of see this by some of the testing that's done and what uh, is given by the unit strength method within the code. Uh, when we go from type N, uh, if we use that, we certainly have a less strong uh, wall assembly, um, something on the order of uh, 13 to 70 percent less strength. Um, but using type S, which could be twice as strong as type N uh, in terms of the mortar compressive strength, really, again, we gain a little bit, but not a lot. Um, by going to that type S. If we go all the way to type M, which again, sometimes we think, boy, that's going to be the, the, the strongest mortar and that's going to be our best uh, strength. You're looking at the unit uh, code unit strength method, you can see that type M and S really do yield kind of a similar assembly strengths. In fact, if we go back to the table uh, from um, uh, TMS, you can see that they the code just lumps them together. Type M or S, either one, uh, if you use either one of those mortars, then we have the overall assembly strengths uh, that you can see in the center column. So again, it, it might be a little bit of a, a, a lure to use the Type M because of the higher strength of the mortar itself, but the overall assembly, there's really no benefit to going all the way to Type M. Um, type S is really going to get you as far as you need to go in terms of the overall assembly strength. So really, really important to realize that, there's, you know, and if you're thinking about Kind of what I'm saying here, you can see that there's really not a really good reason to use Type M um, for most uh, masonry designs. Type S is probably going to be um, the mortar that you want to use. Really, F prime M is going to be the same from the code perspective. You know, and the reason why not to use Type M because it's it's not that easy to work with. It's it's the workability issue for Type M is is uh, somewhat low, so using something that's a little bit more workable, masons like to use Type S a lot more. Um, so really we want to take that into account as we uh, specify these mortars as well. So I think a really good way to remember it is use Type S for structural. Um, it's really going to get you um, most of the properties that you're looking for and be something that masons are going to be used to using and uh, like using as well. The last thing that I want to mention on uh, mortars here is just looking at the overall uh, tensile stresses for the different types of mortar. Uh, again, mortar cement, masonry cement um, have different types of properties, so they have different types of uh, tensile strengths. Where is this going to be uh, important? Anytime that you get into an unreinforced uh, masonry wall, we can still design unreinforced masonry, certainly for uh, stuff like partition walls. Um, if you want to get the most out of your uh, unreinforced masonry design, looking at mortar cement is certainly uh, be a good idea. As you can see, some of the tensile values here uh, higher for those types of uh, mortars. So what types of mortars should you be specifying? Again, you really have the three different uh, ones. You have type M, which is a high strength, but more costly, reduced workability, uh, really doesn't result in a higher compressive strength. Uh, it can be used below grade. It's really kind of reserved for those very high load applications or extreme environmental conditions. Uh, again, we recommend using Type S as much as possible. The structural walls can be used in hot wall uh, seismic design areas, um, and it also can be used above and below grade. Uh, so really Type S can be kind of the, the main mortar that we would like to see uh, for structural designs. You certainly can use Type N for, for structural, but it's more common for the non-structural elements, for veneer walls um, or lightly loaded uh, structural elements like partition walls. Uh, which would have a, a reduced wall capacity. The other thing about Type N is if you did uh, use it in the past, recognize that if you go into a seismic design categories, uh, D, E, and F, uh, you wouldn't be able to use Type N. Uh, and also, you shouldn't be using Type N below grade. So uh, certainly some limitations there uh, that we want to be uh, cautious of. Grout, uh, the thing I would say about grout is it's certainly uh, much different than mortar. It's not the same as mortar. It's got a very different purpose. Uh, mortar really meant to be the glue that holds the units together and, and as you're constructing it. Uh, grout has very different uh, purpose. It, it really needs to be uh, the fill that fills up your masonry wall. It needs to fit in uh, within the cells of masonry. It needs to be a fluid uh, element so that it can flow around the reinforcement, uh, horizontal reinforcement, vertical reinforcement, and, and then not leave any void. So it's really going to be uh, a fluid uh, concrete material filling the cores of, of the CMU um, is again going to be composed of water, cement, sand, and, and some sort of a pea gravel. Uh, there's a finer coarse grout that you can be using and really 
find the coarse grout really comes down to what are the spaces that you have within the actual uh, masonry cell? Uh, do we have a lot of clearance so that coarse grout can fit in around? For most designs where you'd have a single bar, as you can see at the bottom, the coarse grout is going to be just fine. And that's going to be the predominant uh, design for masonry. There's going to be times where you get into, say, more of a column element or something that's going to have more reinforcement kind of packed in a cell. Uh, certainly not something that's common within masonry, yet isolated elements maybe that have this. Uh, but that's where you'd use that fine grout. You have small clearances between uh, face shells and rebar, and you really have to be careful in what you use there. The other thing about grout that engineers tend to get uh, involved with is grout pours and lifts. Uh, there's a really nice guide within TMS 602 that kind of shows you the difference between pours and lifts. And um, really, this, this is a means and methods uh, element. Sometimes I see engineers specifying this within uh, general notes. It's not something that's required for them to specify within general notes. You can certainly um, maybe provide some guidance, uh, but providing options, I think, is really important uh, because there are several different ways to uh, achieve the grouting uh, for a masonry wall, depending on different uh, construction uh, techniques. You can see you can use a five foot four grout lift. And so for a 24 foot high uh, grout pour, you'd have several different stages that you'd have to build up uh, the grout in that in that wall. Uh, or you could have a grout pour uh, with clean outs that maybe achieve a little bit higher uh, 12 foot eight grout lift and then all the way up to 24. You could even use something like self-consolidating grout. So again, you can see the different options that are there, um, contractors within different areas of the country or just different means and methods, uh, maybe prefer one of these over the other. And I would say as engineers, we just need to be familiar with the different provisions uh, and make sure that if we have a contractor that would use uh, one of these different methods that we understand the method uh, as they've been clearly defined uh, within TMS. When we do specify uh, masonry, one of the things that I like to see when I review uh, masonry general notes is I like to see uh, information about all the different elements uh, of masonry. I don't like to see um, when engineers just call out a strength of masonry because as you could see in the previous slides, uh, there's different ways that you could achieve um, a certain uh, assembly strength, you know, higher strength uh, units and lower strength mortar could achieve the same uh, design strength as a, a lower strength uh, units and higher strength mortar. But maybe the mortar, we want to make sure that the mortar is the right type based on the just certain, uh, you know, below grade or above grade, uh, what the environmental conditions are. Uh, and you just want to have a little bit more control over what the actual uh, strengths are of the different elements and be a little bit more specific. So I, as an example, I would say, you know, it's a good idea to call out what the overall assembly strength is F prime M of 2500 PSI. To do that, you need to have a block of at least 3250, very specific. We know exactly what we need now for a block. We have a certain mortar type uh, because I want to use type S below and above grade. Uh, so we're going to call out mortar as type S. And then based on that information, we know that a grout uh, also would need to be 2500 PSI uh, because it needs to be at least as strong as the F prime M uh, or greater. The other thing is, um, you know, and I, I don't see this too often, but from time to time I'll see uh, engineers that will specify two different masonry strengths. Uh, maybe we have a large school that can use the standard uh, F prime M. Maybe that's 2500 for a particular area, uh, but maybe we have a storm shelter uh, that's going to be a very heavily loaded, uh, heavily reinforced part of the actual design where we maybe want to use an F prime M of 4000, uh, something we're going to have to have a lot higher demand on that uh, masonry within that same project. So use two different masonry strengths, specify them on the project drawings, uh, call it the different parts and components that would make up uh, the two different masonry design strengths on your project, and then contractors can follow those uh, as they go into the build. Again, just kind of a recap here, how do we determine what the F prime M is? Again, it's just based on your unit strength, uh, type of mortar uh, within the TMS 602, it gives us the minimum Right, strength of block of 2000 using type S for structural type S mortar. Uh, we're going to have a minimum design strength of 2000. So anybody that might be using something less than that, uh, just recognize that the code uh, since 2013 has been stating the minimum uh, the design strength for masonry with type S mortar to be at 2000. So we definitely need to be at 2000 or above. 
And what I would say for most of the designs in our country, uh, we can use actually a higher strength block type S mortar. I'd say the most typical designs are going to be around that 2500 PSI. Uh, that's going to be the most predominant uh, design strength across the country. Certainly cert different companies offer blocks that are even stronger, uh, 4500 with type S uh, giving us that 3000 PSI. You know, how do I do know this? How, how can I make a statement uh, that most of the designs are at 2500? Um, really, uh, again, remember that 3250 uh, PSI. Uh, what we've done is we did some research in determining what some different uh, block strengths are from the major block manufacturers and in many different states of the country. And again, if you look at the this map, we're just providing all those different block strengths, uh, 43 different uh, block test results uh, here for normal weight, eight inch block. You can see the average strength. Average strength is going to be in the middle of the screen. Uh, average strength being at 4438. So that's a lot higher than that 3250. Uh, we can see that the average all across the country is going to be um, a fair amount higher than that. Uh, actually, the minimum strength for all these different block manufacturers is 3020. And again, it's not to say that we can't find a block manufacturer somewhere in the country that makes less than that. We still have to do our research, but we should be confident in designing to an F'M of 2500 uh, throughout the country. We can run into those situations. Again, if you get into the higher strength masonry, I mentioned 4,000 PSI before, uh, we are gonna have to make sure that we make special note of what the actual block strength is, a higher, that's gonna be higher than 4,000. Maybe block strength uh, for a 4,000 uh, PSI uh, design, maybe we'd want block strength to be around 5,000. Maybe in that situation, it's a higher uh, load demand situation. Maybe that's when we use that type M mortar. Uh, so again, specify all those different elements uh, but then really once we do that, we have to rely on a different uh, method for uh, the strength of masonry. We're going to have to rely on that prism test method. Well, we really build three different uh, prisms um, with the materials that we anticipate using for that design. Uh, we do some load tests for those different prisms. We average them out uh, to elements all test um, with an average that's going to be above the uh, F'M that we're specifying. So. Pretty easy to get there, um, pretty easy to understand how we can do some of this testing. It's pretty simple. It's not that uh, costly to do this, so don't be afraid of uh, recommending some testing um, for a higher strength uh, design area. And again, why is F'M so important? It's, it's certainly going to be something that leads to a more efficient design. Uh, F'M is important when we have an element that we have higher load demands on. Uh, so walls are going to be your predominant element, bearing walls, non-bearing walls, shear walls. They're all going to be a little bit more efficient uh, with F'M. You know, tall, slender walls, oftentimes a lot of people tell me, well, those don't really change, Sam, when you know, I increase my F'M. No, that's fair enough. But the lintels within that tall wall certainly do change. Uh, lap lengths get a lot shorter within that tall wall uh, with a lot of reinforcement. That's going to get a lot more efficient. And then all the connections to those tall uh, masonry walls are going to be a lot more efficient when we recognize uh, the right F'M. So there's plenty of incentive to uh, understanding what the F prime M is, recognize that it's 2,500 or higher. Actually created a white paper uh, for the Midwest recommending 2,500 uh, for the F prime M. Uh, and this, this paper is certainly available. You can certainly uh, request that um, from any IMI representative or uh, from myself as well. So F prime M is certainly important and we really need to understand what it is to get uh, a good and efficient masonry design. Last couple elements here for uh, our masonry wall materials. Uh, vertical reinforcement, again, it's going to be what's going to be strengthening the wall. It's going to give you a lot more uh, capacity in your wall. Uh, certainly, if you add reinforcement, you need to make sure that you add grout in those cells. That's a that's a pretty straightforward um, uh, application. And typically, vertical reinforcement is going to be used in exterior walls. Um, you know, within the code, there's also some pretty good indications for what uh, amount and size of reinforcement you want to use. Uh, within the TMS 402 strength design provisions, it recommends that bars be number nines and less. Again, you think about masonry walls and you think about how we have these confined spaces, uh, putting a number nine bar is going to be a challenge in itself. So recognizing that we don't want to use something, anything larger than that. Uh, bar diameters to be less than uh, an eighth of the wall thickness. Again, small, smaller, thinner walls 
uh, even less uh, for a confined space. And then the last provision of bar areas to be less than 4% of the cell area. Again, why are we adding reinforcement? It really has to do with uh, any lateral load that you have on the wall. The more the lateral load, the more that we can develop uh, tensile forces uh, within the wall. Again, it's going to be the kind of that separating of the far side uh, of the lateral load where we'd have a little bit of tension in the wall, right? So again, we have a little bit of tensile capacity. We talked about that before. If we use a certain type of mortar, maybe we can get even a little bit more, uh, but it's going to be uh, far less than the overall compressive capacity. So again, compression, compression and tension that you have uh, from the bending, uh, from the lateral loads that you have in a wall, adding some reinforcement. Reinforcement is going to have a lot more tensile properties, uh, a lot better at, at tension um, uh, than masonry is going to be. So adding a little bit of reinforcement is really going to go a long way uh, for our designs. And again, thinking about some of those provisions for reinforcement, how much reinforcement you could put in a wall. Uh, really, I created this chart to really kind of point out, you know, fours through nines are probably going to be the most common within masonry walls. And I think we can narrow that down even a little bit more. Certainly on the thinner walls, you know, if we go to doubly reinforce, if you look at the image in the upper left corner, uh, doubly reinforcing a wall would even limit the reinforcement that we would use even that much more. But I think it's always really good to think about what do masons prefer. You know, we have uh, different reinforcement schemes that we can use that achieve the uh, similar or same uh, moment capacity, right? So for like an eight inch masonry wall, 22 feet high, I could do a number six at 48, or I could do a smaller bar at 32, closer together, right? That makes sense. Uh, or I could do two number four bars uh, at 56, a little bit further than that 48. You know, what do masons prefer? All of them have similar capacities and then I do a similar uh, exercise for a 12 inch wall. If I look at my survey results, you can see Masons strongly prefer the single bar uh, number six, you know, 48 inches on center. Um, you can certainly see a few Masons uh, like the number five at 32, smaller bar, easy to work with. Not a lot preferred the two number four bars. Again, it's just too thin of a wall. Uh, we have that confined space putting two bars within an eight inch wall. Uh, is not going to be something that a lot of masons are going to prefer uh, design wise. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. I think you can see a lot um, of good reasoning here. And I think we even learn a little bit more when we go to the 12 inch wall. So, so again, we have a large bar number seven at 56 inches on center. We have that six at 40, so a smaller bar, but closer together, more grout. Um, or we have the two number fives at 64. Two things that we learned here, um, that large bar at the for this spacing is not as preferred uh, as this number six at 40. That's a very interesting result. I think that, you know, why do Masons start to shy away from that uh, first option? It just had to do with the number seven bar. Uh, number sevens are that much harder to work with than sixes. Um, so sevens and up, there's going to be bars that Masons uh, start to uh, sh want to shy away from wanting to use uh, smaller bars. So you can see, um, that's a very interesting result. Four, fives, and sixes are going to be much more preferred. Um, so you can go up to a number nine, but four, fives, and sixes are going to be what Masons would prefer that you choose. Uh, the two number five bars, that actually wasn't too far behind, right? That was uh, something that a few Masons preferred, but uh, the two uh, Masons are going to be a lot more likely to want to build a 12-inch wall with two bars. We just have that much more space uh, within those cells. So. We can see within this result, number sevens are starting to get too big. Uh, two bars and a, a thicker wall uh, do make a lot of sense. Two masons. So pretty good information there, I think, that we can take back uh, as we develop uh, some of our designs. Other things to recognize, and really this slide, I put this in there really for uh, making sure that as you go to the field and you look at uh, where reinforcements placed within a wall, uh, we may specify the reinforcement to be centered in the wall. But this is a really good guide, again, within TMS 602 that shows you with an eight inch or, le or thinner wall, uh, a bar in the center can be plus or minus a half inch uh, from that center line. Uh, if the wall is greater than eight, say a 12 or 16 inch wall, then we actually have plus or minus one inch. Um, so the code is going to be building in all of that uh, tolerance when it develops those capacity equations and so on and so forth. So we really need to recognize that uh, this is a construction tolerance that's just fine. The bars can be a little bit off center uh, within that tolerance as they build the wall, uh, which gives masons, again, 
a little bit more flexibility and uh, engineers can keep their minds at ease uh, as we go out and we look in the field and we see some of these bars placed uh, within Mesa walls. Just understand the tolerances uh, that are built into the code equations. Next thing with reinforcement, lap links. Lap links are something that can be a little bit confused. Uh, for masonry design, there's a pretty straightforward, well, pretty straightforward equation here um, that's developed within uh, TMS. Uh, we can certainly develop different lap um, uh, lengths for different situations for masonry walls. Um, the bar size reinforcement in the center at each face, uh, spacing uh, or overall, um, all of those different variables can actually change um, what the actual lap lengths could be uh, for the masonry walls. If I take that formula and I put it into a spreadsheet, <clears throat> you can see that um, it's pretty easy to see what the actual lap length development length is going to be for different size bars uh, for different situations. And the one thing that I also want to do is compare it to uh, what I would call the old lap length requirement, the 48 times the diameter of the bar. If you see my comments there, uh, you can see for the first four, for number threes through number sixes, uh, the development length is just too long. It, it's, it doesn't need to be that long. Um, so that's just wasted reinforcement uh, you could think of on your on your projects. Number six is it gets pretty close, um, but the really interesting thing I think as well uh, is sevens, eights, and nines, the actual 48 times diameter bar is actually too short. Um, so unconservative uh, is definitely not something that we want to get into. The other thing that we want to remember here is this is all dependent on uh, a few of those different variables, F prime M, uh, Basing of reinforcement, whether the reinforcement's at the center and at each face. Uh, really, I think when we develop lap links, it could be there could be a situation where we have the same bar that has two different lap links on a project, right? So, this example, if I look at uh, W2 and W5, uh, they both use number six bar. With W2, I actually have a 33 inch lap length. Well, no, with W5, I have a 21 inch lap length for that number six bar. So I think that's really interesting to look at and think about, you know, maybe my W5 is the most prominent uh, uh, reinforcement uh, for this project. I have most of my walls 300 feet by 300 feet by, you know, 34 feet high. Uh, They're going to be a 12 inch wall with that reinforcement. I don't want to have that lap at 33 inches for all of those elements. Uh, if that eight inch wall is just used for a little screen wall um, on the project, right? So maybe a, a, a reinforcement schedule and actual lap lengths within that schedule. Uh, this is really clear for contractors. They can certainly look at this chart uh, pretty quickly and see what laps they need to use in different areas of the project. It also gives you know what the reinforcement needs to be. I think that's a, just a really good and clear way to do it. So something that we suggest um, uh, engineers consider. So we talked uh, certainly about lap lengths. These are different ways that we can splice reinforcement. Absolutely. Uh, welded splices are certainly available. Uh, that's not going to be too common, uh, either in concrete or in masonry construction, but that's certainly something that's available. Um, mechanical splices are something that we see used quite a bit within uh, concrete design, and I'd like to see them used a little bit more uh, with masonry design, certainly as we get into some of the larger bar sizes. Uh, using those mechanical splices, especially the threaded couplers, uh, can be very nice uh, within these confined areas uh, in masonry. There's certain contractors actually that prefer to use uh, threaded couplers only to develop their bars. Um, makes it a lot easier for them uh, construction wise. So I would say as engineers, we don't have to specify um, something else, but just be open to and recognize that different contractors uh, might be requesting this. So all that talk about uh, masonry, can uh, masonry remain unreinforced? The, the answer is it, it actually can. Um, you know, we can go all the way back to that uh, chart on uh, mortars. You can see that there is some tensile uh, capacity that we have. But the other thing about masonry is if you just add enough load to it, you know, if I have that bending uh, that I have in my wall, uh, certain create certain tension and compression forces. If I just have enough vertical load, uh, say a floor load that actually balances out that tensile force and keeps both sides of the masonry wall in compression, uh, we still have plenty of opportunities for unreinforced masonry, um, but I think likely uh, some reinforcement is going to be used uh, for most masonry these days. Next, we're going to switch over to uh, control joints and horizontal reinforcement. Um, again, mostly control joints are going to be used uh, for walls that have light, 
reinforcement uh, control joints uh, can be provided. Uh, certain levels of, of minimal reinforcement can be used, um, but there's certain situations in designs um, in all different seismic design categories uh, that control joints maybe just aren't necessary because we have so much horizontal reinforcement already within the wall um, that we don't need to provide control joints. We have sufficient reinforcement to prevent any uh, shrinkage or temperature cracks from developing within the wall. Um, and so it's just kind of a, a modification for um, how we look at the masonry walls and how we can simplify them, I would say, by taking some control joints out um, for different projects. So something that's really important, I think, and we'll talk about this um, maybe more in a different presentation, but you know, making sure that you locate control joints uh, are certainly the responsibility of designer. Uh, the TMS 602 uh, mandatory requirements uh, actually indicates that it's the responsibility of the architect or engineer to indicate the type and location uh, of movement joints and project drawings. So that definitely um, includes control joints. And certainly as an engineer that's trying to have a very good understanding for uh, structural masonry design elements, I think it's very important to have uh, a good understanding for exactly where the uh, control joints are. And I definitely would want to then specify them uh, and not try to guess where a mason is going to provide them based. Because if, if you provide vague information for where the control joints go, uh, then that's really what you left to trying to guess where they might put them. So um, I think specifying their exact location is is definitely uh, the situation that we want to be in. For this, we're going to rely on, uh, uh, this is an NCMA uh, tech guide 10-2D that has this uh, diagram and these recommendations for uh, minimal reinforcement uh, and control joints for masonry. But there's a different NCMA tech guide, NCMA tech 10-3 that looks at the amount of horizontal reinforcement that you need. So no control joints are required. Um, and so you really have those two different options for controlling cracking uh, within masonry walls. If we focus on that, the first one, you know, the minimal reinforcement, um, the first thing that maybe we want to look at is, well, what do we do at windows? If we have that minimal reinforcement and control joints and we have an unreinforced masonry wall, again, we, we've talked about why most walls have some level of reinforcement. Uh, there's a few walls that can still be unreinforced. Uh, in those few walls that are unreinforced, this is where we're going to put the control joints uh, at the uh, opening edges or develop from the corners of the openings. You're going to have some stress concentrations there. You would have a crack that would uh, want to develop from those corners. Uh, and so if it's an unreinforced wall, uh, then we can look at putting those control joints uh, at the opening edge. The much more common uh, structural masonry wall is going to have some level of reinforcement. Again, reinforcement uh, around openings is very, very common. You have jam reinforcement, you have lintel reinforcement. In that situation, again, based on this guide, we're going to put control joints away from the edge of the openings. I would say away from the openings could be eight feet, it could be four feet, um, probably doesn't want to be much less than two feet, maybe 16 inches uh, in certain situations, but the further you can get the control joints away from the opening when it's a reinforced masonry wall, the better. Just a really quick example of that is uh, here's a wall with the opening. You can see control joints on each side of the opening, two feet away from the edge uh, of that opening. So again, we're talking about uh, placing control joints when we don't want to have control joints required on a project. Probably still put some of them in for uh, certain situations, maybe change in wall height or change in uh, support conditions uh, would still require control joints, but so that we don't have to put them at a regular spacing uh, within a project. We simply have to meet a criteria for reinforcement of 0.2% uh, of the overall area of concrete. Uh, so this could be a similar provision to what you'd have, say, in the concrete code. Uh, with, but with masonry, we just have less concrete. We just have face shells. Uh, when we have ungrouted or partially grouted walls, uh, that face shells are going to be the only continuous concrete element. So we'd have a lot less area of concrete that we can consider. So it would have a lot less horizontal reinforcement uh, that would be required. Uh, if we get into a fully grouted wall, uh, then we would have to add a similar level of reinforcement that you would have in a regular concrete wall. Uh, fully grouted masonry walls are going to have uh, a lot more horizontal reinforcement required. And you can see that in the chart uh, below. 
So again, if we look at and consider different schemes here uh, for a typical wall, if we have control joints at regular spacing, um, then we would have possibly standard joint reinforcement that could be provided. Uh, that could be one uh, method for this horizontal reinforcement scheme uh, for this masonry wall. If I had openings to consider, um, certainly that might change uh, where my control joints go. I might have to add some control joints uh, to make sure that my control joints fall between these openings. It doesn't get too close to the edge of the opening. Um, but again, mainly it's going to be control joints plus horizontal joint reinforcement. Um, and this is another option for uh, reinforcing this masonry wall. Instead of joint reinforcement, another uh, option that we have if we want to use regular control joints, uh, what we can do is we can add a mid-height bond beam, uh, provisions for the bond beam being um, you know, within the wall, no more than 12 feet uh, on center, uh, and then have enough reinforcement uh, based on the overall uh, of masonry that we're, we're needing to reinforce. So certainly uh, this is another option. We have a lot less reinforcement uh, in terms of quantity, instead of having joint reinforcement every other course, uh, providing a mid-height bond beam and say a uh, bond beam at the top or maybe a couple at the top because you have some uh, bearing conditions, um, is it just another option for uh, reinforcement uh, for this wall with control joints? And this is just a look at you know what that could look like if we have, again, those openings. Maybe in this situation, instead of having that mid-height uh, bond beam, because we already have a masonry lintel that we would use for spanning that opening, maybe we just make that continuous. Uh, so really it's using similar materials that we would have there already for the opening, um, and then just take that reinforcement continuous to the control joints. Uh, so that can maybe simplify this design instead of having a lintel separately than a bond beam and the bond beams at the top. So just another option for uh, control joints and minimal reinforcement uh, for a wall. So our next options here is, you know, what if we want to look at this wall um, and not have any control joints? Uh, one of the options would be to add enough a horizontal reinforcement that's continuous within the wall um, to prevent any of these shrinkage and temperature cracks from occurring. Uh, so then we really don't have any requirements for where control joints uh, would need to be. So a long wall like this with similar bearing conditions uh, could really not have any control joints. If we again look at that same wall uh, with those openings, this again might be the simplest way to look at reinforcing this wall. You know, we have the lintel that was already there. We have uh, top of wall bond beams and maybe a roof bearing condition. Uh, maybe it's just a couple of the bond beams that we add to this wall uh, that can help us eliminate all the joint reinforcement and eliminate all the control joints. Uh, that might be a lot simpler, a much more cost effective way to look at this wall. Um, so again, just kind of recapping here, um, just understanding what the actual requirements are. We don't have to have control joints. Uh, if we want to use control joints, we can use a less amount of horizontal reinforcement. Uh, if we have a design that already has plenty of uh, horizontal reinforcement because we have openings, we have lintels uh, that maybe just need to be then made continuous, um, then what we can do is we can relook at where control joints would want to be, maybe eliminating some or all of the control joints uh, on a particular wall panel uh, and just use bond beams. So a combination of joint reinforcement and bond beams can also be used uh, to eliminate uh, some of those control joint requirements. Um, so just recognize the different options that you have, uh, which can lead to a lot much more productive and possibly more cost effective uh, design. So that's going to wrap up the uh, first part of the uh, this this talk uh, on the materials. You can see that we talked about masonry units. Different uh, masonry units can be used and specified. Uh, really want to make sure that we understand what the actual strength is of the unit. Uh, using the right mortar type, <clears throat> again, predominantly we want to use uh, type S mortar uh, for our design. Grout, we have different types of grout as well, coarse, fine, or self-consolidating. I'd say as, as engineers, what we want to do is we just want to get familiar with the different options for grouting and grout pours and lifts, um, reinforcement, and what types of grout we maybe want to use for our design. And then for the reinforcement, we have a lot of different options for vertically reinforcing, uh, horizontally reinforcing, welded wire reinforcement, uh, control joints uh, get entered into the mix depending on the amount of horizontal reinforcement 
uh, that we have. So just recognize the different types of designs uh, really can be made more efficiently uh, with just utilizing all the different options that you have uh, for your masonry materials. On the next part, what we'll talk about is uh, masonry elements. We'll talk a little bit in an introductory uh, to uh, masonry wall requirements, uh, masonry lintel requirements, and then uh, masonry columns uh, for design. 